Hello, everybody, and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's continuing Bible studies into the book of First Samuel, heard at this very same time, Monday through Friday. And we thank you for being with us wherever you are and however you're listening to us, either through eBible Fellowship's webcast audio or through Skype or perhaps through Pal Talk or even over the phone. And we pray that the Lord's blessings will be with us over the next 30 minutes or so as we now prepare to open our Bibles and introduce. Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing study in the book of 1 Samuel. Tonight, we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse 3, where it says, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For Jehovah is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is wax feeble. And I'll stop reading there. Um, Once again, Hannah, as she is praying, and uh, God is moving her to uh, pray all these statements. And, and uh, they're basically contrasts um, from verse 4 uh, through the next few verses. Uh, God begins to contrast um, different things. But let's just uh, finish looking at verse 3 where it says at the the second part of the verse, for Jehovah is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. In the last couple of studies, we were just thinking a little bit about uh, how much knowledge God does possess, uh, infinite, uh, just an incredible, vast, infinite uh, storehouse of knowledge. Uh, it, it, if you can imagine the world's greatest library and, and uh, just, just any book that you would want, and, and you could find it at that particular library. Actually, the Internet has uh, almost come to be something like that, where you can uh, type in uh, whatever you're interested in, whatever you're curious about. And and there it is, and and um, search engines keep um, records of all this information, and, and they store this information so that people can access it. And yet, it, I I don't know the comparison, but I I know that um, the amount of information that God has at the ready that he knows fully and completely that he uh, he could impart if he wanted to do so. It, it would be a billion times a billion um, amounts of information that are present, uh, internet and all the search engines and everything that's out there, Uh, presently stores and and that's probably a huge understatement that the the amount of data that god has in store is is really boundless it's limitless because it, it just just the information he possesses on one individual would probably fill up um most of the world's computers because he knows every thought that uh, was was thought consciously or subconsciously every action and and everything else and it's it's just mind boggling when we think of the incredible brilliant mind of god that he has this information at his disposal where he can uh, know all these things, um, not like us. You know, we might know a whole bunch of 
things, but we have to stop and think to recall and and bring something to the forefront of our mind. And while we're uh, focused on that particular thought, we we cannot at the same time be focused on maybe all the other bits of information, small bits that of information that we know. God has full access to everything at once. It, it, it's um, who just just the enormity, the the colossal, uh, tremendous mind of God um, is is really something that is unspeakable and and beyond our ability to understand. But God tries to convey to us on occasion in the Bible um, the relationship of his thoughts to our thoughts. For instance, in Isaiah 58, he says in verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Now that is a, a, a really big understatement, isn't it? That here God is condescending to speak to the creature, to the the little tiny peanut size uh, minded creature that uh, that he created in his image, a creature of time, a creature who is able to learn and to gather information during the the shortest period of time imaginable, just a few a few measly years upon earth and during that time he he uh, learns in school how to read how to write um, how to count uh, and certain other things and and yet what can a creature learn in a limited finite space of time in comparison to the creator who has no beginning and has no end and is eternal and and that creator knows uh, all things um, in the whole spectrum of existence so uh, we we read the words and our minds are so small and and so limited that we don't realize just the the great chasm that exists between these statements as God is setting himself and his mind and his thoughts on one hand and over against that man and our mind and our thoughts. And and he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now there, we're getting a, a little bit better of a illustration um, that maybe we can understand um, uh, somewhat better than past generations due to our telescopes and and our ability to peer out there into the heavens, into deep space, and to realize the distance of some of these stars from the earth. Well, as high as the heavens are to the earth, the, so is God's thoughts to our thoughts. And, and that's one way he compares them, and that is just... Um, telling us that they are supremely higher, that we cannot attain unto the the highness of the thoughts of Almighty God. They are beyond us, and it would be um, like us trying to reach out into space with our hands while we we stand upon a tree. We cannot get anywhere near it. It's only by the mercy and the grace of God that he has humbled himself. He emptied himself of his glory, and he entered into the human race. And he also um, 
out of great care and concern and love, he uh, made a point of moving man to write down the words of the Bible to communicate to us his thoughts, his words, and his communication to each one of us. And, of course, that wasn't enough because still, even though we have it written in in human language and then translated into our own tongue, that's not enough to help us understand. We We see that when we see people all over the world who are confounded again and again by the Bible. They just cannot understand this book. It, it's um, it, it's a stone wall. It, it, it's something they cannot get by. Uh, all kinds of people think they know how to understand the Bible, and they try to use their intellects to uh, come to uh, what they think is a right understanding, and and constantly they are opposed. God um, fights against the proud. And it's only uh, when it's his good pleasure and when he determines that he wants someone to know the truth that he opens up their understanding and he gives uh, certain individuals the ability to understand somewhat the word of God, these extremely high thoughts of the the most high God. This is um, the the wonderful blessing of having a Bible and and having a God that uh, graciously grants us understanding towards the Bible. Well, let, let's go back to chapter two of First Samuel. And finish verse 3, for Jehovah is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Now the word actions is a word that's translated as act or deed, doing, invention, occasion, or work, or works. For instance, in Psalm 14, It says in verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do with good. That's the word action or actions that, that we have in our verse. Also in Ezekiel 14, in verses 22 and 23, it's translated as doings. Um, it, it says, Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings. And ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings. You shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord Jehovah. The doings is a reference to works. So uh, basically that's what this word means. The the works of men. And of course, um, the works of men are normally evil. If they're unsaved, they they are contrary to God. They are against him, and God is is the judge of mankind. And so he he sees the works, he sees the actions of mankind, and he weighs them. Now the word um, weigh is found twice in Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 2. All the eyes of man are clean in his own eyes, but Jehovah weigheth the spirits. And and that's referring to the uh, inner essence of man. Also in Proverbs 21, 2, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but Jehovah pondereth the hearts. Now, pondereth is the same word, weigheth. And actually, this is the same statement as Proverbs 16, 
Uh, two, the, the only difference is that the translators translated the same Hebrew way, the, the same Hebrew word weigheth as pondereth, and God used the synonym instead of spirits, he used hearts, because in the Bible, heart, mind, and soul are synonymous. And and so here, basically, Proverbs 21.2 is restating what Proverbs 16.2 uh, had said. And, and God here is indicating that he weighs the hearts. He, he is a God we can gather from... Um, from uh, the, the verse in Samuel where actions are weighed, that is works, deeds, outward doings of people, the things that we say, the things that we do, uh, our works in this world are weighed by God. Uh, he considers them. He's noticing them, and and uh, of course, if they're sinful. He's marking them, and, and and he will hold us accountable um, if we do not become saved or if we did not become saved, and he will destroy us for our sins because of our actions. And likewise, the Lord pondereth or weigheth the hearts. He not only is looking at the outward acts of people, but God also is a God of the inner man. And and this is um, an area the world uh, knows really nothing about as far as um, legal things. The, the world makes its laws against outward actions. And so they have a law against murder and a law against stealing and and so forth but the world does not even bother to try and stipulate laws against inward thoughts against inward goings on of the heart of man what would be the use uh, they they would have no way of knowing they would have no way of enforcing the breaking of that law and since everyone does it, um, it, it, it would be something that the world uh, would not even dare consider to try and enforce. So, yes, um, the world would say, even today, to some degree, it's, wor it's wrong to commit adultery outwardly, physically, uh, with the actual act. But they say nothing about the inward thinking and the inward lusting. And the world would say it's wrong to kill. But they'd say nothing about the inward hostility and the inward hatred. And they, they have limitations. They cannot enforce the area of the spirit of man. But God has no such limitation, and God sees the inner being as well as the outer um, acts of a person. And so God stipulates laws for both, and God makes no um, difference between an outward law and an inward law. Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to commit adultery in his heart, he, no, how's that go? If a man lusts after a woman, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's not a lesser form of adultery. That is adultery in God's eyes. It is a sinful transgression of the law. And that sin alone, without the outward act, would be enough to convict and condemn and destroy a man um, completely. The, the, because if you transgress in one point, the Bible says you're guilty of all. God makes no distinction 
between the outer and the inner sin. He sees both. He weighs both. He he weighs the spirits. He weighs the actions. And and so God um, really has a standard that that man uh, cannot bear. And and this is one of the problems uh, with mankind and why they they don't want to of their own accord go to God according to his word. They they don't like the light. They don't want that um that introspection that the word of God brings as it shines the light of purity and holiness and truth into their hearts. But maybe if it just remained outer uh, outside maybe they uh, they could endure certainly more people could uh, they they would be fine with trying to maintain an outer um uh, uh, obedience to the word of god but the word of god requires much more much greater obedience an inner obedience and and who can who can bear that to to always have your thoughts um, scrutinized and analyzed and 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 pondered and weighed, and to have God um, seeing everything you do. No, no, we we'd rather not have God in all of our thoughts. We'd rather not have Him, uh, not not have anything to do with Him at all. If that's what uh, is going to happen. And so people, they flee the light, and they try to get away from it. But but this is the standard, whether we like it or not. The standard is absolute perfection, and that's what it says in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfect outwardly, perfect inwardly, a perfect being, a perfect creature, because we're made in the image and likeness of a perfect God. But nobody can be perfect. No one can can obey God perfectly. We will fail, and and that's one of the reasons God gave the law, so that we would see our failures and our our constant sins and our transgressions and how we fall short of the glory of God. And then we would realize the wages of this sin is death and we're under his wrath and we're subject to destruction and eternal destruction and annihilation forever where we cease to exist and and God used this. It, he used the law to bring us to the end of it. And at the end of the law, if we're one of his children, if he has drawn us along this route of seeing our sins and, and being made sorry for our sins, we'll find the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law. And then we realize the grace of God and the mercy of God and that uh, he he has come for sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous because there's none righteous. Oh, there may be some who, uh, like the rich young ruler, they'll claim that they keep those outer laws, but there's none that can keep the inner law, the law of the heart. And so there's none righteous, no, not one in all the world. And And so the child of God... Uh, rejoices and thanks the Lord that that Christ came to call sinners to repentance and not the righteous. Well, going back to 1 Samuel 2 and uh, into verse 4, it says, The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. Now, um, here... The, the statement, the bows of the mighty men are broken, is indicated, indicating the, the, the weapons 
of the mighty men, and these these would be men in opposition to God and his kingdom, the enemies of God. They're, they're um, ones who would shoot bow and arrow uh, at the people of God. And, and uh, now Hannah is praying and rejoicing because the birth of Samuel has given occasion to, uh, to uh, exclaim, these types of statements, the bows of the mighty men are broken. Or, in other words, as Samuel typifies the birth of Christ, the Messiah, it, it's um, pointing to the power, the the weapons of the enemy are destroyed. They are broken. Um, God says in Psalm 37, in verses 14 and 15, The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. So you see how God is turning it around uh, upon the, the enemies of his kingdom, the kingdom of light and, and the kingdom of his people and he takes the weapon right out of the hands of the one that would dare shoot an arrow uh, towards the poor and needy, and he breaks it. Another verse is in Jeremiah 51 and verse 56. And there it says, Because the spoiler has come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken. For Jehovah, God of recompenses, shall surely requite. Now we, we get a very good image of what God is talking about because Babylon is picturing the kingdom of Satan as he came against the people of God, Israel, uh, well, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar historically came with Babylon against Israel or Judah, but spiritually Satan came and his emissaries against the churches and congregations during the Great Tribulation, and they they came to do hurt to the people of God, and and they did um, overcome the the children of God. Remember the two witnesses were overcome. For three and a half days, or pointing to 2300 evening mornings, the first part of the Great Tribulation. But God uh, has a plan, and he turns it around. And at the end of 70 years, or at the end of the Great Tribulation, he uh, now fights against the ones that he had commissioned, Satan and his army, uh, uh, the king of Babylon, and God takes their mighty men and takes their bows and breaks them. And it is a picture of the judgment of God upon the ungodly because they, even though God commissioned them and used them, as he spoke of Nebuchadnezzar as his servant, it doesn't excuse the responsibility of the sins that um, that historically Nebuchadnezzar uh, was guilty of and and also that Satan was guilty of and all those that that were used by him in destroying the churches and congregations. They bear their responsibility for their sins. All God in using them just simply lifted his hand of restraint and let them go forth and, and destroy. Well, uh, we're going to stop here for tonight, and uh, Lord willing, we'll uh, pick up the study in First Samuel again tomorrow night at this time.
You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Chris McCann with his continuing studies into the book of 1 Samuel. These studies are heard every Monday through Friday night at this very same time over Pal Talk, over Skype, over eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over the phone. Lord willing, we'll have another Bible study for you tomorrow night into the book of 1 Samuel. And until then, may the Lord's perfect will be done. Good night.